welcome to the Free Cities podcast. My name is Timothy Allen, and this is the official podcast of the Free Cities Foundation. Hello, and welcome to episode number 31 of the Free Cities podcast. Now, Today's show was one of my favourite interviews from our recent trip to LibertyCon in Lisbon. I was fortunate enough to get time to speak with a gentleman by the name of Thomas Walker Worth. Thomas is an associate editor at The Objective Standard, but formerly a town planner in the UK, and as such he has much to say on the designing and organising of free cities. During our conversation, we take a deep dive into the reality of what it's actually like planning towns, as well as making some predictions about the prospect of designing places to live in outer space, particularly Mars. Thomas has some uniquely informed opinions on the morality and practice of governance in these future frontiers, which, to be honest, prior to our conversation was not something I had ever thought about. Other topics covered include new urbanism, 15-minute cities, postmodernism, flying cars, environmentalism, collectivism, and we discuss the role that Elon Musk may take in the future of alternative governance models. Now, I loved this conversation, full of facts and figures and intelligent observations. I feel like I learnt a lot, and I hope you too will get to take away as much yourselves. So, without further ado, just sit back as always, relax, and enjoy my conversation with Thomas Walker Worth. start with just a little bit of a rundown of who you are and what you do then um you obviously public speak sorry can i tilt this up a little so it's you can do whatever you want yeah more at me is not you're the sound man <laughs> you've actually studied sound at university is that right yeah um so yeah i did a I, I had i talk about this when i talk about finding work and finding purpose um is that my career direction was a confused mess for the first sort of 10 years after school so um I, I when I was at school I thought I wanted to be an astrophysicist or, or a paleontologist. I was really interested in outer space and, and geological history. So I thought I'd go into one of those fields. But I'm terrible at math and I'm terrible at focusing on anything that I'm not interested in, so I did badly at school. And um there was a brief period where I thought I might go and work on the railways and then I ended up doing music at university. So the first two years was a music production diploma and then that went into just a musicology degree and masters. Wait a minute. Railways. Yeah, yeah, I'm a railway enthusiast as well. Uh, are you? Right. I'm a massive transport geek. I love planes, trains, buses, boats, really most stuff. There's a few things that don't interest me so much, but yeah, railways is like the core of it. I absolutely love train travel. I go to preserved railways, steam railways all the time. Have you done any big train trips across the world? Uh, the longest train journey I've done was Boston to Chicago on Amtrak, which was 21 hours overnight which was not much fun, <laughs> really, even for me. So Never wanted to do the Trans-Siberian? I, I would be interested in that. Um, Russia would have to get its shit together as a country before I would do that, but um, yeah, it's, it would be interesting. What I'd rather do is the Canadian, the Toronto-Vancouver, because that looks stunning. That's three days in a sleeper car with view lounges, and, and yeah, I'd love to do that. Toronto to Vancouver, so... Yeah, that I've that does that is that the route that goes via all the big old hotels that used to be part of the they called the debutante circuit back like a hundred years ago or whatever it was. I'm not sure. Um, it goes through Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Calgary, Banff, and like yeah. through the Rockies. Banff, yeah, yeah. like the, ba- the I I I did, I worked in Banff once um, at that ma- amazing hotel there. I was doing a speech. And the guy that was hosting it told me all this history of, of, you know, those amazing hotels that you find. They're very, they look like castles all around sort of like quite remote parts of Canada. 
And apparently they were part of the debutante circuit. So when you left, you know, when you're a young lady or a young gentleman and you left school and you wanted to meet people and you were in high society, you went on this little tour and stayed in these hotels and there were balls and there were this and there were that, you know. It was pretty, pretty interesting. But I mean, I mean you can understand when you go there why, because it is, it's like traveling between fairy tale, fairy tale castles. And yeah. uh, on a train, yeah, amazing. I wonder if those hotels had any connection to the railroad because that, that's often how private railways made their money was by operating hotels in stations, operating shops in stations, that kind of thing. So if you look at railways that were built by private companies, even in England, you, you usually see grand hotels at the stations. If you think of the St Pancras Hotel, yes. like you know, that was a massive revenue source for the Midland Railways. It's part of how they made train travel profitable. Another place that I worked actually at that hotel when it was de- derelict, unbelievably. I worked, I worked in uh, in London for seven or eight years, and we used to use that hotel as a um, location for films. Mm. Uh, famously, I don't know whether you remember the Spice Girls' first song, "Tell You What I Want." Yeah, remember. yeah, yeah. That was yeah. filmed I didn't in St Pancras, first, but the, yeah, yeah. They, they they come running down a big sweeping staircase right at the beginning of that. That's actually St Pancras Hotel when wow. it was derelict. But the bit the the, the 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 atrium that you first walked into was still in kind of good nick, but you could look around the rest of the hotel and it was it was derelict. And now it's obviously been turned into i've not been in there since it's been done up but it looks pretty impressive yeah yeah it was a, it was a really impressive restoration on that so yeah quickly finish my story um so yeah i started doing a, a phd in music actually um which was studying this sort of avant-garde electroacoustic music and i very quickly realized i hated that and i hated the whole academic attitude to music which was very superior and um it was a lot of people listening to stuff that no normal person would ever listen to and congratulate themselves for seeing the value in it. And um, I just hated the whole mindset. And it was at that point that I was getting into Ayn Rand's ideas and I just suddenly got this wave of, I don't need to impress anyone else. I can do what I want with my life. So I dropped out and um, went to work as an urban planning consultant for a number of years for parish councils. Um, growing up in Milton Keynes, I had quite a strong interest in urban planning as well and, right. and city design so that was my last career before i got into philosophy and tell uh, me something was did ayn rand's philosophy have any effect on how you urban planned yeah definitely um so in a couple of senses one is that i very much respect the right of landowners to develop their land as they see fit so i generally try to resist efforts by local authorities to restrict and control and I, I wrote a paper for the Adam, Adam Smith Institute about high street zoning laws in the UK, which are ri- ridiculously restrictive and very one size fits all. They're set by the national planning policy framework. So somebody in Westminster says every town centre in the UK has to have this primary shopping area where all the shopping should go, basically, and then a retail area, uh, uh, sorry, residential areas and industrial areas and office areas and all this kind of stuff which doesn't work in any town because you end up getting certain types of retail leave and go into out-of-town retail areas. And then because you can't change the high street for other uses, you end up getting dead high streets. But Milton Keynes, it was even worse because Milton Keynes doesn't have a high street. So all all of these laws on a national level that were designed to make a high street more viable and, and focus retail into a high street area just didn't work in central Milton Keynes, which is entirely indoor shopping to begin with. But so, who designed it that way if there were zoning laws then? Like, so well, it was built in the 60s, 70s, right, 80s. Pr- prior so, to these laws. Yeah, a lot of this stuff came out of the National Planning Policy Framework, which is a relatively recent innovation, if you want to call it that. But um, yeah, UK planning law is basically the result of the 1948 Planning Act and the 1992 Planning Act, which both introduced nationwide restrictions on where you can build, what you can build, how you can build. And then the MPPF is a a high-level planning document under which all of the local plans have to sit so they they all have to be consistent with the nppf so what i mean did you do you think you had any effect <laughs> yeah i i i mean i had a lot of effect on sort of a macro level of just having meetings with developers and encourage them them to make their developments more interesting more attractive that kind of thing but I, I think in terms of I, I was working for parish councils and for one of the parish councils I worked for was very pro-development. So I had a lot of effect through them of sculpt, sculpting their planning responses to be more pro-development, more encouraging. And um, particularly in Milton Keynes, there was a whole controversial issue about height 
because there used to be this thing that central Milton Keynes was supposed to be mostly trees with the building spread in between them. Nothing was supposed to be too tall. And I was trying to get away from that and encourage a more positive attitude to taller buildings. And thankfully, the town council was with me on that. What was the reasoning behind that then? Just it looked nicer or something? Yeah, it was built on Ebenezer Howard's principles of garden cities. If you know Welling Garden City and Letchworth Garden City, they were designed by Ebenezer Howard in, in the 1910s. And his principle was the city and the country where housing and countryside are kind of combined into a, an environment where you have a bit of both. And um, and then the later new towns in the 40s, 50s, 60s, places like Stevenage and Harlow, kind of lost that vision and just became concrete jungles. But Milton Keynes and Telford, the, the very last generation, were trying to get back to that. So there's a lot of parkland, there's a lot of trees. But the problem is you eventually run out of space if you try and build at such a low density. So in Milton Keynes, we were trying to move more towards a high-rise city centre, more like an American city centre, and try and allow us to retain that parkland and green space elsewhere by concentrating density in the center so resisting the high buildings in the center was basically saying okay do you want to build over all the parks instead so um milton king has a really bad reputation it has a really bad reputation amongst the common person let's say do you think that's just do you think it's justified is it like what do you think of milton Keynes? is it is it has it worked is it is it was it a success you know it definitely has worked on a lot of levels um, it's definitely got flaws, but uh, of all the new towns in Mil- uh, sorry, of all the new towns in the United Kingdom, it's by far the best. It's by far the most successful. Um, part of that is its location. It's halfway between London and Birmingham, halfway between Oxford and Cambridge, so it's just right in the middle of all the activity in in England. Um, but it's also it was designed on the principle of freedom of movement. So the the grid system, the the fast roads. It was basically the principle was we'll lay out this network of roads that will enable everyone to get everywhere really easily, really quickly. And then the development will just kind of fill up the gaps over time. And so there was there was it was a less rigid planning regime than you had in places like Stevenage and Harlow, where they tried to say, you're going to shop here, you're going to live here, you're going to work here. And the reality is human beings are unpredictable and they don't go shop and live and work where you think they're going to. And if you go to Harlow, it's one of my favorite examples. There's this giant pedestrian plaza which is on first floor level and it was supposed to have all these shops around it and the reality was that nobody wants to open a shop on the first floor level away from the street where they're not sure who owns the land if they have the same property rights they would have if they're on the ground it's not really on the way to anywhere and what you end up with is just this windswept space with no activity around it nobody in it and then you have all these improvised shopping areas outside where they've sprung up later because you needed shops so um the plans in those sorts of towns never came to fruition because they had this too centric, too top down mindset. Whereas in Milton Keynes, it was able to adapt more. You could just move things from one block to another if it needed to be somewhere else. What do you um, what What do you think about fifteen minute cities? Then, like, firstly, like, why do you think um, they were invented, or why Why do you think this this meme has appeared all of a sudden? We need fifteen minute cities. Yeah. Yeah, this idea has been a thing in urban planning for decades that you should try to build services near housing. And that's a totally legitimate concept, like have shops and that services that people need within easy reach of their home so they can walk to them is a completely legitimate approach to planning. And that's been Milton Keynes was built like that. You have a local center in every estate. But the problem with the 50 minute concept as it's come around now is that it's about restricting people from going further. So it's fine to design a housing estate and put a shop in it and put a school in it and try and make that all walkable. That's a perfectly sensible thing to do. But when you start saying, oh, you can't drive to the next estate to go for something else. You know, if you've got a Tesco in your estate and there's a Sainsbury's on the next one and you would rather go to that and oh, you're not allowed to drive over there now. Or, you, or the situation in Oxford is if you want to drive anywhere else in the city, you need to go out to the ring road all the way around and back again, which just puts all of the traffic on the ring road and they're not expanding the ring road at all. So it's just going to cause traffic issues. But Presumably it, it causes pollution as well. Yeah. More so than not. Is it? I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but having to drive out to a ring road to go around to come back in would cause more pollution than being able to nip across a, I don't know, the city. Is that, I mean, it's, it's based on, on the environment, the 50 minute city, isn't it? Yeah, that's probably true. And I would avoid using that argument because that buys into their premise that what they're doing in the name of reducing pollution is valid in the first place. And I don't think it is. I don't think reducing people's quality of life, their ability to 
shop and take their car so they can get as much shopping as they need and, and that kind of stuff, their freedom to go and see their friends, whatever, in the name of slightly reducing carbon emissions is even valid. If I, firstly, I don't think there is a climate crisis. Climate change is a real thing and it is a thing to be concerned about, but we're not anywhere near an imminent crisis by any stretch of the imagination. And when you've got China putting out thousands of times more pollution than Oxford ever could in its entire existence, it's, you're, you're not even making a significant change on a global level in any... Like, Britain could cease to exist, and it would make no... It would barely make a dent, if, if at all, on global carbon emissions. So this idea that we should be restricting people's freedom and choking up our economy and harming the people's quality of life in the name of it's really not about reducing carbon emissions it's about looking like you you're trying to reduce carbon emissions it's very second-handed it's very about politicians looking like they care it's the same thing we've seen in the last few years with covid and everything the policies are more about how the politicians look than about actually achieving any real outcome something i've always thought about um you know, cities that are built all in one go, like Milton Keynes, these kind of centrally planned cities, is they never seem to look or feel good. Like uh, everywhere you, like Bristol is my, the nearest place that I, 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 nearest town to where we live, big town. And there's a bunch of sort of like concrete parts of Bristol that are really, as soon as you walk into them, you feel like there's a bunch of drunk people there, everyone hanging out. This was supposed to be a place when you, I always remember when they sort of draw these plans of what these cities are going to look like. You, you see these open spaces with people walking through them and, you know, computer generated. But the reality is you tend to get drunk people hanging out in those places because we don't congregate in places like that naturally, right? Mm. Um, so my my thought always was that when you look at a really successful town it it evolved it evolved very slowly over time and the same goes for um properties like you can tell a property that's just been done out all in one go and a property that's kind of been built over 200 years and got bigger and bigger and bigger and there's a big difference between them the 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 centrally planned one is never as inviting as the one that sort of evolved naturally am i is that true do you think or is that am i making that up i i think it can be i think it depends on the philosophy that the planners had and and their motivation for doing it so it's one of the flaws of milton keynes in my eye is that it's not particularly beautiful in a lot of the time in the city center i think a lot of the suburbs are beautiful because there's a lot of leafy parks and lakes and that kind of stuff the city center has some outstanding buildings but a lot of them are very blocky, very uninspiring to look at. They they have they, they put a lot of attention to things like proportionality of colonnades and p- columns, that kind of thing. But there's not a sense of, wow, this is a gorgeous building. Uh, and that's even more true in the earlier new towns, the very concrete ones. And, and uh, yeah, you're right about Bristol. There's, uh, there's some hideous planned developments in the center of Bristol. But then when you, I mean, but, when you compare it to the, the, the period high streets... They always feel good and they're always full of people milling around. Sometimes. I don't know that that's exclusively true. Like if you go to some other towns, places like Luton and Bedford, where there's still that natural evolution, but the economy hasn't been strong. There's not been a, a sense of pride. You, you don't get the same kind of beauty. And then conversely, if there are some planned developments that look absolutely stunning. Like if you look at the Edinburgh new town, like the, the new half of Edinburgh is planned in the late 18th, early 19th centuries. And and that's absolutely stunning. Or if you look at Washington DC, or if you look you, in a modern example somewhere like Poundbury, where it's where's that? It's on the edge of Dorchester. Um, it, it was basically Prince Charles, as he was then, owned a bunch of land and decided he wanted it developed as this kind of neoclassical town. Now I'm certainly not saying that neoclassical architecture is the way to go for planning, but he had his own idea of what he wanted to create, and he did it on his own land. Now he's he was a monarch, you know, he was part of the royal family, but. In a free country, a private developer could do the same thing. And um, and when you get somebody who's just doing it out of passion and wants to create a beautiful community, you get a much better project product than when you have a bunch of planning academics who have the latest ideas about how planning should be done and what architecture should be. And what you got with the new towns was a lot of postmodern thinking about how people should live, how, peop- how architecture should be designed, a lot of resistance to not just classical in the in the architectural sense, but just old ideas about how, how people should live and how things should look. You got a lot of this Le Corbusier 
idea about you should drive into your giant concrete cube which you live in on a giant concrete freeway and and that it was it's the same situation we have now where what's in vogue is the only thing you're allowed to do in in the industry like nowadays new urbanism this idea that we should never use cars and everything should be human scale nothing should be grand and impressive and it's it's all you cycle lanes down the middle of these beautiful sort of parisian streets and and there's and then but then conversely to that the architectural um sort of current mindset is mismatched windows and jagged lines and all horrible colors that don't agree with each other and bits sticking out for no obvious reason there's this very postmodern very anti-beauty mindset in architecture at the moment i've that actually happened in my neighborhood i live in a very rural part of wales and there is a manor house there that my neighbors live in it's an old it's one of those ones that used to be a court basically and they wanted to extend their kitchen and they weren't allowed to do it in the style of the house. They had to build a glass um, cube onto the side of the house. And the reasoning from the council was it has to look obviously like an addition, Jesus. which is the most <laughs> ridiculous. But that was, they didn't do it in the end. But that was all they could get. They wanted to build it in the you know, They wanted to actually extend this building in the style that it was. And they, they weren't allowed. Well, that's exactly the mindset that's problematic is when you get people who think that because they're in office in an urban in a local authority or in government or or because they're a member of the royal town planning institute or something like that they have the authority and and the right and the knowledge to tell everybody else how to do something and and they do have the legal authority to do that and so you get these people who have terrible ideas forcing those ideas literally forcing them on on everybody else whereas you know somebody like that should be free to do that if they want to to do something worse if they want to and to do something better if they want to and most people generally want to do the best thing they can in their eyes with their own property but it's the problem is a lot of the new towns and and new developments in older towns came from that mindset of people in government thinking they know best or people in in the industry thinking they know best because they're in that sort of university educated current stream of thinking and not letting things happen in a more natural more incentive motivated way do you do you have a theory on why postmodern ideas gave rise to these incredibly i call i call them sociopathic buildings because when you walk into a, a scenario where one of these buildings are sitting it, it does feel sociopathic it's like i'm not trying to make you feel comfortable here i'm not trying to impress you know you maybe i'm trying to impress you actually if you see a giant square or something but what what is it about postmodern ideas that means people want to design buildings like that i think it was an postmodernism was a rejection of the enlightenment so and you see this in in every field from theater to music to visual arts like painting and sculpture and architecture it's just across the board even in film you see it and it it was an intentional rejection of beauty of harmony uh, and of humanity really because the enlightenment was all about it, it, the enlightenment was a revival of the greek classical idea that human life is wonderful that human beings should have a good life that we should improve our world and and live to the full and postmodernism is an outright philosophical rejection of that it starts with immanuel kant and hegel those sorts of philosophers and then gets cashed out by people in in music like schopenhauer people not schopenhauer sorry that's a philosopher um people in music like stockhausen and, and and john cage and people like that and then in the architectural side like le corbusier who overtly reject beauty and embrace this nihilistic negative anti-human mindset and it's exactly the same thing that led to avant-garde as they call it music which is this or music concrete which is this just it all came out of paris for some reason which is this just horribly atonal um, structureless just oppressive music and it's exactly the same kind of thing um, with that school of architecture and it's still present in today's architecture we had a nice period in the 80s and 90s where architecture kind of backed away from that and went back towards being a bit prettier and a bit more in in keeping with how people actually want to live and now it's gone right back to this kind of progressive postmodern rejection of of beauty and, and harmony and and it's, it's important to note like beauty doesn't mean classicism exclusively like classicism can be beautiful but good architecture is when you design a building that is right for its purpose 
And that means it's practically functionally good for its purpose and it looks the way it should for its purpose. So if you're designing a theme park or you're designing a grand hotel that the hotelier wants to show off and impress people, that's going to be a different building too if you're designing a house or if you're designing an office building and different clients are going to have different needs and different wants. And a building should express what its client, what its operator needs and what its function is, just as any product should. And um, when you have this imposed, rigid architectural style that everything has to match, you, you get this cookie cutter situation where every building in every town is following the same handbook, which is motivated by a, a philosophic idea of rejecting the old and just being different for the sake of it, instead of this diverse, interesting mixture of styles where you can clearly see what's working, what's not. You have that more com- competitive situation which if you look at older towns and older cities um, in any country really you'll see that you'll see a wide variety of styles from different periods and different industries that you get you get an interesting mix and you you get a a diversity and that we've completely lost that in recent years so do you think there's any validity in the postmodern look as other than it just being a, a rejection of the previous idea of beauty say or i mean what is it is that just a bunch of slightly challenged people being nihilists and then and then sort of imposing it on everything they do or what you have to be really careful with terms like modernism because they can package together different things so i don't think there's there's plenty that's valid in modern architecture in the sense that there's plenty of validity in the idea of of function before form of designing a building to be practical before you worry about whether or not it's pretty and there's there's plenty of validity in, in simple architecture in in going away from classicism for one reason or another what's invalid is the postmodern with a capital p the 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 specific philosophy of postmodernism which is that over rejection of of beauty and uh, of humanity i think i don't validity probably isn't the right concept but it's certainly a a, a wicked anti-human philosophy and i don't want to see it and i don't think anyone should want to see it it's fine if somebody wants to do that with their land then they should be able to. But I, do, I think you'd get a very tiny minority of people who would get to a point where they own land and have that ability and then would want to do that with their property in a society that isn't, that, isn't made that way through, through a university system that's encouraging those kinds of ideas. You did actually describe, when you were talking about postmodern music, as oppressive, as quite oppressive sounding. It, so you think it's no coincidence that, you know, oppressive, centrally governed places tend to to veer towards postmodern architecture. Is that a fair thing to say? I mean, that's what I've noticed around yeah. around the world. I mean, can you imagine if music was centrally planned by the government? Like how dire <laughs> that would be? Or film? I mean, you see a bit of it, what happens with film in, in, in countries that have government-run broadcasters. But it, you you end up with things... You, you actually see this when, when you get arts councils, government arts councils funding films and things like that. You get wacky avant-garde films that 10 people want to watch and no nobody in their right mind would go and see not that a lot of the mass produced movies that people do go and see are particularly valuable either but you you would get a far worse kind of focusing of energy and that's one of the fundamental issues with government is that government takes by force from people and then decides what it wants to do with what it's taken so it takes your wealth and says we know better what to do with your wealth than you do and you get this distortion effect where money flows in directions where it wouldn't naturally flow. It's like if you've seen The Simpsons, there's that episode of The Simpsons where they go to Australia and they have the, the American embassy has the machine that makes the water in the sink go the right way instead of the other way. <laughs> and it's like you get this kind of mindset of we need to force things to go in our direction, even though they're naturally trying to go in a completely different direction. And you, you'll always get the best outcomes when you let human beings do what they want to do naturally and don't try and tell them from the top down what's the proper way to do things. Okay, then. So you, you, you have um, experience in planning cities or planning towns and stuff so you you know the the, 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 i'm going to offer you a a chance to um design your own private city let's call it it doesn't even have to be a city it could be a village it could be a jurisdiction or whatever how do you go about it what are the what are the things that your own philosophy have taught you or that your experience have taught you that are the primary things that you should do you take it imagine you're the city operator you're trying to attract business basically you're trying to attack attract people to your free city let's say 
How do you, what are the, what are we, what are you supposed to look for? What are you supposed to make important in those places? I think the first thing I'd do is stop myself because it's very easy for a planning enthusiast like me or anyone who's, who's ever drawn a map on the back of a piece of paper and likes cities and transportation and that kind of thing and is interested in that stuff to just take an opportunity like that to design the thing that we've always wanted to see and design something that we think looks cool. And that's almost certainly not going to be the thing that will actually work and will actually be best for the people who live in it. And that that's the overriding problem with those sorts of projects is that you get somebody imposing their idea. I remember I, I interned in a planning firm for once and um, they were working on this development near rugby. And at the time, the plan was to design the development to look like a rugby ball from above. <laughs> And I remember one of the planners, thankfully it didn't get developed that way in the end. It, 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 this is the old rugby radio station site. And it, for, fortunately, it's now been developed in a more sensible way. But the, the, time at the, the plan at the time was to just have these giant, basically oval-shaped roads that look like a rugby ball or you know, like American football if you're in the States. And um, I remember one of the planners coming up to me and saying, I hate this. You can't make people live in a rugby ball. <laughs> <laughs> And it's true. It's, it's this completely <laughs> misguided idea. And planners have this horrible tendency to look at everything as though they're looking down on it from space. Because they have this top-down, literally top-down view of looking at things on a map. Mm. And they see everything from an angle that you're only going to see if you fly over it in an airplane. And otherwise, the people on the ground don't experience that top-down view, which it looks lovely on a map. It's like road junctions. Like If you look at road big interchanges on freeways from above, they look gorgeous sometimes. They have these beautiful swinging shapes. But on the ground, they're just road and trees, and you, you don't see that beauty from above. So the first thing I would do is, is not try to plan it the way I would naturally want to plan it. I would want to put awesome-looking roads and squares and all that sort of stuff. And I, I would just say, no, like, build maybe a framework, like, put some basic infrastructure in there and let people develop around that. If, if I'm coming in as a landowner... Um, the ideal approach to planning is just to let people do their own thing, but people are going to own land and do their own thing on their land. If you're the one owning the land, then you get to, to do some initial stuff. Like I would probably put some infrastructure in, which I would then operate as an infrastructure operator and let people who know what they're doing in terms of how to provide housing for people and how to provide businesses. I, I don't think I, as, a, as an urban planning person, um, to the extent that I am one, know how to build a shopping center. Like a shopping operator knows how to build a shopping center. You need to be a retail expert to build a good shopping center, not a planner. And likewise with housing, you need to be a housing expert, not a planner. A planner knows how to build transportation systems and, and maybe a few other things. But I think one of the biggest problems we have is that planners think they know how to plan an entire city, which means they know how to plan people's lives and people's businesses. And we don't. We, we, we know how a city functions on, a, on an infrastructure level. So I, I would limit myself to providing that and then probably operate that, like be a road or rail infrastructure operator and then let the thing grow around me, which is actually how some of the nicest parts of London were built. If you go to places like Ryslip and Northolt in northwest London, those were built by the Metropolitan Railway. So the railway built its line out into the middle of nowhere and then it basically started building housing or invited people to build housing around their new railway stations to generate revenue for the railway. And and you get this beautiful, it's called Metroland, you get this very nice housing in that area, which is entirely infrastructure first and then housing to support the infrastructure. And I think that's the best way to design cities is provide the infrastructure and then let the housing grow around it. I mean, you just mentioned shopping centres. I mean, I'm not even sure shopping centres are a good idea. Like what, I mean, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I don't necessarily like going to a shopping centre. As opposed to just, you know, wandering around little streets, looking in shop windows, you know. I mean, what am I, just old fashioned or something? Am I getting, am I getting it wrong? I, I think there's an idea that this kind of American model of shopping where there's a giant out of town retail plaza that you have to drive to to do anything is a natural product of the free market. And it's not. It's a natural product of American zoning laws, because in the United States, in most states, you have this extremely restrictive approach to zoning where large amounts of land are single occupancy homes only and then there's little blocks where you can build retail and you can't build one shop in these huge areas of single occupancy home retail zone so even if a developer wants to do that and i think it would make sense for a developer to want to do that to find other ways to monetize their land besides just sticking housing all over it 
more sustainable ways like retail rents. They can't. They, they, the zoning laws force them to not do that. And then the retail operators just have to go where they're zoned. So you end up with this sprawl where it's just loads of housing, giant freeway, and then the retail area is half, you know, half, half an hour away in your car. And that's not a natural way for a city to grow. I think a natural way for a city to grow is that people buy up land for their own purposes and a retail operator is going to want to be near the people who are going to use their service. And and things like retail, office, transportation, housing, they will all naturally congregate towards each other for economic reasons. It's not a natural situation for uses to be spread apart from each other. And it's also not a natural situation for giant freeways to link together places like that. In, in a free market, you'd only get a giant freeway if somebody thought there was a, an economic case for building one between two existing probably areas of demand. Do you happen to know when centrally planned cities were invented? Like, has it always been that way? Or At least as far as the Romans, they, they were doing it. So it's been a concept for 2,000 years. Um, if you In England, we have Winchelsea on, on the south coast, which was built in the 12th century on a grid pattern, uh, which is a little planned town. Edinburgh, as I mentioned earlier, has a large planned section. You have large areas of London that were planned in the 19th and, well, mostly in the 19th century. Very historically, though. Is it is it something that we have discovered works over the years, or I mean, what's your opinion on it? Like I said earlier, I think it can work if you if you do it with the right mindset. It's difficult to look at a Roman city and say did this work or not because the Roman society and economy was utterly different to ours and was very rigid in many respects to begin with. Roman history is another interest of mine, and. Um, I don't think you can look at a Roman city and say, did it succeed when you had a, a society that was uh, antagonistic to innovation and, and to enterprise anyway, uh, certainly in the imperial era. So it's it's difficult to take that out of context and look at it and say, was it successful? You can do the same thing with American cities. American cities were, were largely planned. The, those grid layouts happened because of people planning from the start. But they were much more successful up until the interwar period when the zoning laws start to come into effect than they have been since. If you look at American cities in the 1890s, 1910s, they, they are beautiful, they're busy, they're functioning, they have great transit systems, they have really active centers with, with lots of retail and, and interesting activity going on. And then you look at the same place in, in, in post the 1960s and it, it's a freeway ramp and, and a parking lot and there's you know, it's a 10 minute walk between two buildings and it's just dead space. And American cities today, the centers of them, a lot of them, not all of them, but my, many, are really bleak environments with large amounts of surface parking because that's the only thing that landowners can do with their land. Uh, a large building that's on its own in the middle of a parking lot and uh, a whole lot of freeway infrastructure that doesn't need to be there and that was put there through force, through people, through, through governments buying up people's houses, demolishing, well not buying them up, start that again. Basically what the American government did in the 50s and 60s was demolish large tracts of housing, usually poor housing but rich housing too, and stick a road through that would never have emerged in a, a private economy and then watch the city disintegrate as they banned certain kinds of development in it. There's a really good play um, with Ray Fiennes called Straight Line Crazy, which is about the life of Robert Moses, the urban planner in New York in the 50s. And his mindset was that everybody should use the car. He wasn't interested in anyone who wanted to travel by any other means. And he saw his position as a means to implement his vision of a New York that was full of highways. And he, he bulldozed large chunks of Brooklyn and Queens and just stuck these highways through and, and tried to push the streetcars and the trains out of business. And um, that kind of mentality in Britain as well, but way more so in the United States, really decimated in the city areas and, and left left those beautiful cities a, a mess. So do you, do you think that this kind of um, centrally planned problems are a novel thing or are they a result of, for example, like you said, the car? So the cars added this new aspect to planning, which says you don't have to put everything within walking distance of each other. Say, for example, presumably they had horse and carts, though, and still thought the same way. So what I want to know is whether you think that we're going through a period of you know history where this isn't working whereas it has worked in the past or do you think it didn't work many times in the past as well i don't think technologies destroy things i think people destroy things so 
people with power tend to destroy things. I, I wrote an article on my Substack. I have a Substack called Technological Optimism, and I wrote an article about how roads basically froze innovation in transportation. Because if you look at the period from the advent of the steam engine, or even the advent of the canal in, in the late 18th century, the advent of, of steam-powered canals, through to railways and then motor cars and aircraft, you get this constant innovation in transportation. There was a new way of traveling every 30 to 40 years. And then you get big roads, freeways, basically, come along in the 30s and 40s, invented by Nazi Germany, interestingly, and then and then start to take over everywhere else. And that's the last thing. There's been basically nothing since. There's not been the successor to the big freeway as a way of traveling, because that was the successor to the railway, basically. And aviation kind of came along at the same time. But aviation got stymied. It it got frozen in place. Aircraft design is improved in some ways, but really hasn't improved as an industry since the 60s. We still fly around in basically the same jets we were flying around in in the 60s, sometimes literally the same model. And um, and road design done the same thing. It's just completely ground to a halt. There's not been any innovation. And part of the reason is that the government was able to put roads wherever they wanted to, whether or not there were people in the way and whether or not there was a good economic case for it. So you end up with this unnatural road network that completely disincentivizes innovating other new solutions. So there's no incentive to innovate a new kind of rail link or like a, a maglev or a hyperloop or anything like that. There's no innovation. There's no incentive to innovate local air travel, like new like vertical takeoff and landing. Like they had this idea in the 50s and 60s that you'd have little jump jets that could fly you directly from the center of your town out to the airport, and you could get on your big plane directly. And there's no incentive for any of that because there's these giant roads everywhere and there's this mindset now that your car is the freedom to go anywhere. Whereas in a free market, your car would only be the freedom to go where there happens to be a road available for you to go. So it's a distorted market because of government road building and that together with regulation and the restrictions on the economy that the government cause has just frozen innovation in place and we're stuck with a 1950s solution to transportation. It's funny. I've, <clears throat> I've one of my pet hates is the sound of road traffic, and as a result, we live in a very remote um, house in Wales, where you actually, apart from there's a very small single track lane next to our house, it's the only road noise you can hear. But often, I'm sitting in my garden thinking about the future because I'm trying to preserve this peace and quiet. And it did occur to me that probably. When, you know, I'm often when I'm driving around the the Welsh countryside, you see houses right on main roads and you think, okay, a hundred years ago, that was a benefit being next to that because basically the odd horse and cart went past and that was it. So, but you wanted to be near the road and now I'm trying to get away from the road. But actually probably what's going to happen is when flying cars take off, the, 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 the airways are going to go to the places where the people aren't living just in case someone crashes, they're going to fall out of the sky. So I'm going to go back to being the place where everyone's flying over me because I live in a place where there are no houses. <laughs> you know, it's like trying to keep one step ahead of, um, of of technology. I don't know. Do you think flying cars are going to are going to happen? I think they would have happened a long time ago if if we'd had a freer society. Part of the reason flying cars didn't happen they they've existed as a viable technology since the sixties. But part of the reason they didn't happen is that government-run air traffic control systems couldn't keep up with them and weren't prepared to adapt to them. And and the, the FAA in the US basically said, we can't handle this, don't do it. So it, it's if you, if you had a, a more free situation in terms of air traffic control, then it would probably already be a thing by now. My concern now is that aviation at the moment is horribly limited by environmental restriction and and I, there's going to be enormous resistance to any attempt to innovate new forms of flying or any solution that increases the amount of flying people do because of this environmentalist attitude of we must protect unspoilt nature and not improve human life if it harms nature in any way which is completely back to front because human life is where all value comes from it, it's rational beings like us seeing things and living that gives things meaning so this idea that we should restrict our lives to protect a world that nobody would be there to see if we weren't here is is completely upside down i do have some sympathy sympathy with that argument though being someone who's a lover of wilderness myself and whilst i understand the theory i don't necessarily feel comfortable putting myself at the center of the universe if you know what i mean it's just a personal thing 
but but I do see what what see for example what I, what I find annoying is once again I'll go back to uh, we live out in the middle of nowhere for a reason um, one of the reasons is people leave you alone another one is it's quiet another one is there's loads of places you can go which are untouched and what happens now very often is those untouched places are places that can get developed mainly things like wind farms uh, solar farms you know regardless of whether you think those kind of technologies are useful or not the whole point of bringing them to these places is because it won't annoy people and I get it it's like yeah it's annoying me because I live here but the reason I want to preserve the wilderness is because me personally I know I get an absolute intense feeling of uh, wellness by being in those places but I know I'm in a minority so I know actually that I don't really have you know a, a, a short of just buying up as much land as I can and saying right you can't develop this which is unfortunately I can't afford to um, so I do have symp sympathy with the, the sort of notion that you know we shouldn't necessarily always say what well, is it good for humans okay then we should definitely do it um, so it sounds like you value nature because it's good for humans, because you like looking at it personally. Yes. And I, I will quickly say that recognizing that moral value comes from rational beings, i.e. humans, because humans are the only rational beings we know about at the moment, doesn't mean we're at the center of the universe. There's a sort of false dichotomy between this religious mindset of humanity is the most important thing in the universe and the other, the sort of nihilistic view of we're just... You know, blobs of flesh and nothing else it, there's we are conscious rational beings and we are where meaning and morality come from if there are other rational beings out there in the universe that would be true for them as well but at the moment we're the only ones we know of so it's it's just a matter of evidence and logic that we are where moral value comes from but i think there's a large enough chunk of the human race that wants beautiful landscapes to for, for it to be profitable to preserve them uh, I had, my colleague John Hersey wrote a couple of articles about this. Um, I think it's reinventing or reimagining public lands is one of them, where he talks about uh, uh, the importance of public spaces and how in in the United States the the National Park Service has made it harder to protect and preserve and maintain those spaces and access them than would have been the case if they were looked after by charities or companies that maintained them as beauty spots. And this happens anyway. You get organizations that spring up to look after these sorts of places even in situations where you have government run ones as well so i think there's enough motivation for that on top of that things like wind farms i don't think wind farms would exist in a privatized economy because there's no economic case whatsoever for building them they don't make any sense as a, as a means of generating power on mass they make sense as a way of powering one small thing like sticking up a wind farm to power a single piece of equipment makes sense in some situations not a wind farm a wind turbine to power a single piece of equipment makes sense in some situations or putting it on your canal boat or something like that but building buying up hundreds of square miles to build thousands of these things that require constant maintenance to generate a minute amount of energy compared to building one nuclear reactor that takes up next to no space and delivers enormous amounts of energy the the difference in energy production of nuclear power compared to any other form of power means that i'm pretty sure in a fully privatized system nuclear power would be by far the leading form of power generation now it makes absolutely no sense to you it's literally like but instead of buying a car thinking i think a horse would be a better way of traveling i think i think i'm gonna go that way and everyone should use horses it, it's mind-boggling that we're seeing wind and solar as the best way to generate power they take up so much land and they produce so little energy for it compared to nuclear power or even compared to gas power but nuclear power is orders of magnitude better so that would there's no way that a private economy would result in wind power taking over the landscape it just wouldn't make any sense economically for that to happen at the same time i don't think the owner of a home has a right to the view from the home I, their property rights in, involve certain things like you shouldn't be able to if you own a home then somebody shouldn't be able to come along next to you and start polluting into your land they shouldn't be able to do things that threaten your ability to live or develop your land like the way you want to. But you also don't have a right to the entire environment around your home. And I think that's the result. That's the, the cause of a lot of nimbyism is this idea that people have a right to a view. Or, and you, you get situations like you have in, in London where there's all these protected view lines looking to St. Paul's Cathedral and you can't develop anything there. And it's just another strangulation of, of economic activity. And we lose even more 
beauty as a result of that you, you get politicians who think that they know what matters and what's important and what isn't we, we lost this wonderful building we could have had in london a couple of years ago called the tulip which would have been gorgeous but sadiq khan and and then michael gove waved it waded in and said oh this isn't important we don't need a viewing platform it, it's not good for the environment it's it, and all of that beauty tourism ec- economic activity that we could have had was just stamped out of existence by politicians thinking they know what's best funnily enough the right to a view, I agree, it's not a right, but you can monetize, you can actually give it a value. And Prospera in um, in Honduras, which is one of the Free Cities projects, is trying this out, or at least when we were there, they were talking about basically giving you the option to buy the 3D space in front mm-hmm. of your house. So, you know, do you really value your view? Like, how much yeah. do you value it? But, which it seems like a very, a very... Um, fair way to do it because you actually get to put a price on it then because it might be too expensive for you it might be that do you know what you know like the price of your view is so high and you're not willing to pay it so so and there's the there's the result there's your free market telling you that you could actually do you don't want it that much you know i think that would very quickly adjust wouldn't it like you you might have a few homes where it's cheap to buy the view and then quickly as more people want to build homes there'll be a a higher and higher asking price for that land to stick things on it um, I mean, that's how manor houses worked back in the day uh, when rich people in, in the aristocratic period of English history built their giant manor houses in the middle of the countryside. They'd have acres of land around it and half of that was just to build a giant avenue so you had an awesome view, both so you could look out at it and so people coming up the drive to visit you had this super impressive view of your house. And it's extremely expensive and inefficient way of achieving a, an impressive effect. But yeah, it's something that certainly the wealthiest people could do. I mean, that's what people do when they buy homes in the south of France and places like that that are right on the edge of the cliff and they're, they're buying that whole experience and nobody's going to build a building in the middle of the sea right in front of them. What's, um, have you been out to the Middle East before? Only to the UAE and Turkey. Not. Okay. What do you think of the... Did you go to many UAE states or... Just Dubai. Okay. What did you think of the way Dubai was working, especially from a planning perspective? And I've spent a fair bit of time out there and I've got my own opinions on those places in the Middle East that kind of sprung up very quickly and, you know... Um, I would never want to drive on Sheikh Zayed Boulevard. That's that's one thing. The, the main road down the middle of Dubai is this 15-lane monster. And um, also Dubai has a law where you, you basically get arrested if you get into a car accident, regardless of whether or not it's your fault. So I, I these accidents happen all the time. So I, I wouldn't want to drive in Dubai. It's a very top-down city in terms of how the movement is planned. That They have the metro and the tram, but those things are really only there as as a service for tourists and and the, and the palm jumeirah monorail as well but the the bulk of the city's transportation system is just these giant government roads that are um are put in place before anything else is and, and i don't think would ever emerge as a as a natural product of, of free market planning um this is a beautiful architecture in dubai i don't agree with the people who say oh it's all fake and plastic and ugly and modern i think there's some really gorgeous buildings um, most of which, you know, a lot of these buildings are still designed by private architects who in Dubai have this freedom to do awesome stuff that they don't have in London or in, in the US really anymore. So you get things like the Palm Jumeirah Hotel and and the Burj Khalifa, which are just absolutely stunning buildings that are interesting and, and beautiful. Uh, the Jumeirah Hotel is, is the one with the curved mm-hmm. side. It kind of looks like a sail. And it's an absolutely gorgeous building. And you get the really indulgent stuff as well like the atlantis hotel which looks like something that belongs in disneyland which isn't really an outstanding piece of architecture but it's interesting some but, of the islands as well the yeah the, I mean, the fake islands the, 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 the part of the thing with those is they were a vanity project for the government and they wanted to build three of these palm islands and then the world as well the one that looks like the, the world map and the money ran out when when the 2008 crisis happened so they only ever finished one of the palms the other two are just sitting there in, dead and empty do you know what's happened to the the world map Has, have any of the islands been colonized yeah about 10 of them which and, ones? And, and i don't know which ones but <laughs> it, it's it's patchy and it was supposed to be finished in sort of 2012 or something like that and yeah it's still just a bunch of lumps of sand in the sea and this is one of the things you get when governments run projects is you just get useless stuff like lumps of land lumps of sand in the sea if you've been to dublin there's yeah well, once briefly one of my favorite wastes of government money is the dublin spire it's just a giant metal pole 
300 feet high in the middle of Dublin. It does nothing. It's just there to show off. And it was in, in the Celtic Tiger period of when there was a ton of money flowing into Ireland from the EU and basically they thought they had endless money and they just started sticking up this pointless rubbish and building projects for the sake of it. And it's, it's, it's very, it's like 1930s America when they were just building projects for the sake of building projects. And, and yeah, this spire is, is the ultimate symbol of it. It's just a completely useless thing. I've, I've, like I say, I've worked a fair bit in the Middle East and <clears throat> like in, I, a couple of things I particularly remember, I worked in Qatar for a couple of months once and I was put up in a Italian um, canal c- c- place. Oh, well, I you, Sounds like w- the Venice Hotel in Las Vegas. No, no, no. Yes, yeah. but it was an actual neighbourhood that was designed with the canals down it and and um, the you know like period buildings and everything. And whenever I walked out the front door, there was just no one there. That was the, that was my problem. I, I don't think it's only governments that that mess up these things. You know, like you get private companies that do this as well that create these things that people don't go to i mean i mean isn't that what's happening in china at the moment on a very large scale well well china is a situation of the government is trying to maintain this false bubble in in the retail market in china so they've encouraged all of this building on the edges of all of these cities if you look at them on google earth it's crazy how do they incentivize that then well, they're buying up. Well, the, the government is owning this land and seizing this land, and then ordering it to be developed. And I, I'm not sure on the on the in terms of where the money's coming from. But the developers are building this housing that nobody's moving into, and then it's getting demolished again because nobody lives in it. And these entire planned cities that no developer could have bought all the land to build that. That that's government land. Um, and then because this market has stagnated, they're now doing the same thing overseas where the Chinese government is making deals with countries in Africa and Eastern Europe and other places to for their companies to do the same sorts of projects. Or And a lot of these are Chinese state-owned companies. Like CRC is a Chinese state-owned railway builder and, and they built the, um, or one of the Chinese state-owned railway builders built the Ethiopia to Djibouti railway line, which again, there's no economic case for. And the African governments can't repay the loans for that. So they're just so, trying to keep the economy well, it's churning. It's trying to extend this growth economy despite the fact that a that's run out of steam and b the lockdown in china has killed the economy for three years and also creating a debt trap for these other countries because these countries can never repay the loans that the chinese government's given them so they end up defaulting on those loans and then china can a count on their support in votes in the un and b can start saying oh we'll put military bases in if you if we cancel if we cancel the debt will you let us put bases in your country so china is is just jumping from extreme to extreme of trying to artificially incentivize this runaway growth that's completely unsustainable in its cities and its construction industry and um, and then trying to extend that overseas and it, yeah it's it's going to blow badly something i saw with my own eyes in china <clears throat> i i started going there you know a few times when it opened up and because I was I was a photographer and I was really fascinated by a lot of the indigenous kind of groups that lived in China. And what happened over the period and since the last time I went there, which was probably about five years ago now, is the government were picking um, places that were particularly beautiful. A lot of them were indigenous villages and basically turning them into tourist attractions hmm. and people were moving out or... They were staying there, but they were saying, right now, dress in your traditional dress and, you know, be be who you are. And this is now a tourist attraction and people just come there. It was just it was such a hideous thing. But I mean, a lot of countries do this. You know, they they kind of want to preserve things, Um, you know, and so you take any building and rather than rebuild it, if it's decrepit, they might even just want to preserve it as it is and then come up and look at it in this preserved mm. state and it was always a strange uh might a strange experience seeing that but um i want to talk about planning in outer space now i know you've written about this and i assumed it would be kind of you know pie in the sky ideas this that and the other but it, as it turns out there's legislation already happening the united nations have got a treaty on how to colonize outer space uh Elon Musk's, you know, they've got 
well, what, what I loved uh, was you, you sort of have turned me on to Elon's plans for how he would like to govern or how he thinks governance should happen in space. Um, can you just give me a, give me, try and give me a 101 on how space is going to get colonized according to, to what you know? Well, the question is, at the moment, we don't really know how that's going to happen because we have this situation where there's a treaty in place, the Space Treaty, which has been in place since the 1960s, which hasn't been tested yet, which vaguely says that space needs to be used for the benefit of everyone and that no nation can claim sovereignty in outer space. And it's not clear at the moment whether that means can people profit from space? Can a private company mine an asteroid for profit? Or does it need to be doing it altruistically? Because that's economically never going to happen. And it does, does it mean that a new nation can claim sovereignty in outer space? Or does it mean that everyone in outer space is just acting as agents of their home countries when they go out? So we really don't know how it's going to happen yet, because there's this treaty in place that was modeled on the Antarctic Treaty. It's this treaty that was trying to stop one nation from exerting complete control during the Cold War, where there was a concern that the United States or the Soviet Union would basically try to monopolize space militarily. So the point of the Space Treaty was to stop that from happening, but it was written vaguely and imprecisely. And with this impressive government hubris of thinking that they can designate a treaty for the entire universe... Like, I don't think they appreciated how big space is. But, <laughs> but it's <laughs> also a bit rich to say, you know, like, you can't have dibs on Mars if you get there first, because that's not fair. It's kind of like, well, of course it's fair. That's, it's, you know, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but we have a history of colonizing places. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I wrote an article for FEE, the Foundation for Economic Education, about this, saying how, trying to apply John Locke's principles of, of property to, to something like Mars. And his basic principle is if you mix your labor with a natural resource, you own the result. And it's the same moral principle that Ayn Rand identified of. You, you, own, you have a right to the product of your productive effort. So if you go to Mars and you start making a bit of Martian land valuable and turning that natural desert into something productive into a city or into a mining operation whatever you you should own that and um and that doesn't mean that reaching mars means you own the entire planet it just means you own the bit of it that you make useful the the one caveat i would add to that is that i do see a need for government to protect property rights i don't think you can have a, a an environment where people say this is my plant and that's your plant and we can use force against each other if we want to and i can just shoot you if if i want to take over your part of the you, know, you need somebody to enforce that so um and maybe if for an interim period that's an earth-based government temporarily but it should definitely be a local martian government pretty quickly uh, i think there's a you you have a problem with frontiers where uh, frontiers are wonderful things they encourage innovation you you put people out into this wilderness environment and tell them to live in this inhospitable place away from pre-existing structures and ideas and this is what happened in america is you had this harsh environment and the old ways of doing things were half a world away and people could leave that behind and start again and implement a new system and you you, you got this wonderful demonstration of how freedom can work as a result which then showed the rest of the world how to do freedom and the fact that we now have sort of two-thirds of the world being relatively free in terms of countries is because of the United States' example. Even though we now are in a situation where some countries are becoming freer than the US because the US has slipped into being this big government state where everything on it is controlled and, and increasingly surveilled. Um, the reason that other countries are freer is because of the example that the US presented in the past. And we don't have a country that can do that now. And um, somewhere like Mars, when there's people living on Mars, where there's a 20 minute at least, depending where it is in its orbit, at least a 20 minute delay on communications getting from Earth to Mars, you're, you're, way f you're back to the situation you had in America in the, in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, which is that there's a communications delay, there's a separation from the old world. And if the old world tries to run the new world for them and tell them how to do things when they're there in person, learning and adapting and innovating on the ground, you're very quickly going to get a, a an unhappiness between them. And this is played out in science fiction really well. If you watch The Expanse or Babylon 5, two TV shows and a lot of books as well that have dealt with Martian wars of independence, which is what you're going to have if Earth-based governments try to run those colonies remotely. Well, so, also, they're going to be private colonies, aren't they? Because there's, there's no yeah. government effort to 
Like at the moment, there is, but it it won't get there first. Is there really? It, yeah. Are there government plans to colonize Mars? You, not colonize, but visit. And this is I, I talked about this. My wife and I ran a conference a couple of months ago um, called Innovation Celebration, which is all about science and technology. And one, I gave a talk on on freedom in the final frontier. And one of the things I was explaining there is that the Apollo program in the 1960s to go to the moon was a goal-oriented program with one express goal, which was to land a man on the moon, or as it ended up being 12 men on the moon. But the goal there was a national prestige goal. It was about, can we beat the Soviets to reaching the moon? And all of the effort went into that. And it was a very efficiently run program because it was just achieved this one goal. And as soon as they achieved that, it was kind of like, well, what now? There was no economic motivation. There was no sense of making something that was um sustainable that was continuable so they, they've blown billions on this project and then had all this expensive hardware and nothing to do with it and none of it was optimized for commercial uses in any way so yeah, the program ran for six missions seven if you count apollo 13 and then the money ran out and they just said well, well there's no point continuing this we're not really doing anything we're doing some some science but other than that there's no economic reason to keep doing this um, and now there's the Artemis program, NASA's program for going back to the moon as a stepping stone for going to Mars, which makes absolutely no sense physically. The moon is part of the Earth-Moon gravitational system. So you're just staying within Earth's gravitational environment and then launching out again versus just launching directly to Mars makes a lot more sense. Um, isn't, physically. Re- isn't something to do with the gravity there anything to do with it? Or the fact that if something goes wrong, they're only going to blow up a bit of the moon? <laughs> no, it, it, it makes more sense to just design multi-stage vehicles and you park one of them in an Earth orbit and then fly up to that and then launch out. There's, there's Robert Zubrin came up with a system called Mars Direct, which is designed to be the most efficient, cost-effective way of getting to Mars. The problem is government organizations don't want the most cost-effective system they want the most job creating system and you see this throughout nasa's history it, it, every from the space shuttle program is a shining example of it and now artemis is even more so it's a multi-billion dollar project to create jobs in florida and texas and other places and to sustain existing jobs so it reuses space shuttle hardware which doesn't work the space shuttle had solid rocket boosters which are the most ridiculous concept ever they're giant fireworks you light them and you can't turn them off again (laughs) so they 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 just keep firing for two and a half minutes until they run out of fuel whereas a liquid fueled rocket you can rev up rev down is that what is that what um elon is doing so yeah, Elon is using methane-fueled liquid rockets, which are the cheapest, most efficient form of propulsion, rocket propulsion you can use. Whereas Antares for the for the NASA Moon program is reusing the space shuttle's solid rocket boosters, which are just mind-bogglingly unsafe and unreliable. And it's it's just baffling that they are going that route of trying. And they they're claiming it's for efficiency. They're like, if we reuse space shuttle program hardware, we will save on costs. And the thing is. Orders of magnitude more expensive than what SpaceX is developing, which is brand new, completely innovative hardware. Like SpaceX has designed rockets that can land themselves remotely after. So when the first stage separates a couple minutes into flight on, on the Falcon, SpaceX Falcon rocket, the booster pilots itself back to the launch pad and lands vertically, which is really impressive because trying to land something on a single point of thrust is like trying to balance on one leg of a chair. But they innovated this system for doing that because that made the rocket cheaper to operate, so it made it more attractive to clients. So it proved to investors that they're trying to create something efficient, something that's going to work in the long run for making space travel cheaper. And and SpaceX has divided the cost of launching to space by a factor of five, which NASA failed to do in 50 years before that. And then Starship is going to do that over again, whereas NASA is just perpetuating these old technologies, these old ways of doing things for the sake of creating jobs and it says a lot about nasa's priorities that the first moon mission is all about getting the first woman and the first person of color to the moon and it's like yeah those it's perfectly true and good that people of color and women should be going to the moon along with everyone else but the fact that that's their goal rather than to create a sustainable colony or to create a a economically valuable product says a lot about the motivations of government versus the motivations of private companies so i have absolutely no doubt that SpaceX will get to probably the moon and definitely Mars first 
um, assuming government lets them. The only situation in which I see them not doing that is if government forcibly resists them. They'll probably get the first woman and person of color to Mars that, before NASA does as well, even if they're not on the first flight. So, yeah, it will definitely be private companies. And SpaceX aren't the only one. There's Blue Origin. There's um, Astro, Astro Sciences. I can't remember the names now. But um, there, there's several. There's a whole group of these companies, Scale Composites and several others, who are all... Sierra Nevada is a really interesting one, who are all developing private spaceflight systems. So yeah, there's going to be a space race of private companies, and then there's going to be the American, Chinese, maybe European space agencies kind of stumbling along at the back of the race saying, wait for me. They'll yeah. probably co-opt the private companies, won't they? I mean, that's normally the uh, modus operandi, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, one of the criticisms that's thrown at SpaceX quite a lot is that they've received NASA funding uh, because NASA ran a program for private companies to develop human spaceflight systems for them to use to go to the international space station and when when the space shuttle was retired because it kept having fatal accidents they the nasa went to using the russian system for a number of years and so they were trying to come up with something new that would make them not dependent on russia for transportation to and from space and they realized i think to some extent that their own system wasn't going to be ready in time and wasn't going to be good enough. So they invited private companies to apply for funding to speed up their development. And SpaceX got a lot of it and developed the Dragon system as a result. And Dragon has been available years earlier than the than NASA's Orion system. And it's just more efficient. Has It can carry more people. It's just better in every sense. And, um, and NASA would still be relying on the Russians today in the middle of the Ukraine war to, to do that if they hadn't... Um, hadn't contracted SpaceX to provide it. NASA basically gave SpaceX money to provide a product and a service, and SpaceX has come through and done that for them. I like your um, analogy that the colonization of America is the same as the colonization of, sp colonization of space. That does make sense, actually. And it, arguably, it would just... It'll it, it'll unfold in exactly the same way for the for the reasons that you said that it is a long way away. They, you know, like it's almost like it's a bit like you know Bitcoin, and you can't. There's not much you can do about it. You can complain about it, but you can't stop Elon going to Mars. And once he gets to Mars, you can't really tell him what to do. Yeah, you know, like it's it's kind of the genie's out of the bottle in a way. Isn't that it? that's the exciting part uh, about space colonization from a political or sociological point of view is that it's so large that government won't be able to extend its influence. Existing governments won't be able to. Now, I, I you will get a diversity of new governments, and that's an exciting thing in itself. Unfortunately, some of them will be bad. There will be some dictatorships that spring up in outer space. I'm sure in in the long run, but you will also get this innovative competition of social systems and one of the sad things about the world today is that there is nowhere on earth to set up a new society antarctica is off limits because of the antarctic treaty there's seasteading is is an interesting possibility but i don't think that earth-based governments are really going to let it happen i don't think they're going to allow a threat to their control their system um, to spring up on their doorstep effectively. It's an exciting possibility. I'd like to see it happen, but... I, I think the point is that it's not necessarily on their doorstep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, CSIRs aren't necessarily... They're, they're, they're also mobile. Yeah. So... It, it, I would love to see it happen. I think it's a really interesting possibility. I think space is a more likely and more viable in the long run way of doing what the United States did uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries, which is becoming an exemplar of liberty. I, I think it's far more likely we'll get a civilization on Mars, probably. It, Mars is by far the best candidate for this sort of thing, but there's other possibilities like the moons of Jupiter and Saturn in the longer run, but or an asteroid. But I think Mars is the most likely place. It's got all the resources you need to run a civilization. It's got a tentative atmosphere, at least. It's got manageable temperatures if you're at equatorial latitudes. So it, it's by far the most reasonable place to do that. And yeah, I, I think Mars in the long run, if we get this right, will be the America of the future. Talking of governance models in space, I have actually spoken to someone else about this on this podcast. He was, um, he's a banker, Sean Paul, his name is, works in working in Prospera. But he had some of his own opinions. And his his opinion was that a governance model in space would probably have to be quite 
authoritarian because there will be certain rules that you cannot break. Like if you do something that compromises the structure of the place you're living, everyone dies kind of thing. What do you think about that? Oh, I certainly wouldn't call that authoritarian if the law is just don't kill people because that's a completely legitimate function of government is to stop people violating each other's rights. So that's not authoritarianism, that's freedom. That's preventing people using force against each other. So uh, people violate rights when they use force against one another and the government's proper function is to stop people from doing that, to stop people from forcing each other to act against their will or killing them or any kind of coercion really. The, it becomes authoritarian when the government starts using force to coerce people. So, um, and and any any use of force to coerce people is a rights violation. It's just it, there's a slippery degree of, of of it. So all all governments on earth today are a degree of authoritarian. They all use force to, like we were talking earlier, to plan cities certain ways or to spend money on this or that project, and that's a use of force. And that you can either not use force against people, or you can to some degree. But we wouldn't call Britain or even the United, the United States authoritarian. You know, they, those are broadly rights-respecting free countries, whereas we would call North Korea or Russia, Russia authoritarian. But they are a sliding scale of, of degrees of rights violation. And it's, the difference is that the, the really authoritarian countries, you do it to a much larger degree and in a much more severe way. They curtail freedom of speech, freedom of protest, that kind of thing, um, which is far more severe and important in a way than curtailing your, your freedom to use all of your money as you see fit but it is the same principle but when a government uses force to stop you from murdering your fellow citizen that is them preventing rights violations not committing them what do you think the sweet spot will be on mars then do you think anarcho-capitalism could exist there or do we need like you alluded earlier that you think there's a role for the state to play in in these systems I think there's a role for a state to play. I think you need a government to ensure the protection of rights, but that's all it should do. What about a, what about a free private city on Mars? Would that work? Um, I would. I. I. It depends. If, in a sense, that already has a government built into it. So if, yeah, but it's pri- I mean, you sign a contract basically to be a member to 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 to, to live there. Rather than you don't sign a yeah. contract with a government. You know. Yeah, I mean that sounds like a better system because there's actually a an individual consent. And one of the problems with with government is we have this um, ridiculous thing called social contract theory, where where there's this idea that you somehow consented to be taxed and governed because you happen to live in the society. It's like I never consented. You can't consent collectively. You you can't. I mean, but people can get together and say, you know, here's twenty of us. We've all signed this thing, but you can't. You can't say, oh, 56% of the society voted for this, so you've consented. Because I didn't. I, I, I withdraw. I, I refuse to consent. And um, the yeah, that kind of system where you're coming in voluntarily, if, if, if you can leave voluntarily and, and you've signed this thing consensually, then yeah, sure, that, that makes complete sense as a way to run a city. But you, it, it still needs a legal restriction of the use of force against other people. It needs... For a, for a place to be free, it needs to not be possible to use force against other people. And um, to, the, to, an, to the extent that either a government or an, you know, an authority of one form or another either fails to prevent people using force against each other or engages in the use of force against people itself, it's failing in the one fundamental function of, of a government, of an organization that governs. Because the thing that makes government different from any other organization is that it has the exclusive ability to use force and that's that's where its function comes from is that either everybody can use force or force is controlled by an authority and then that authority has to use force in the correct way which is to prevent the use of force by others what are the big differences then between in your opinion the colonization of america and the colonization of space the the the, the technology is the obvious one the the severe difference in the environment and it, how will that manifest in in the the choices made, the decisions, the the governance models, etc. The so one of the reasons that authoritarian governments don't work is that they ignore reality. They ignore reality about human behavior, and they ignore reality about physics and economics and all all of these just facts of existence. They they try and force things to go their own way, regardless of of truth of fact. You can't do that in in an extreme environment. 
and you saw this in the West to some extent. Like in the West, uh, Johann Norberg talks about the fact that they they couldn't stop women from teaching because they needed teachers in this extreme environment. There weren't that many people around. People needed to know how to do stuff. You, you have to throw your silly traditions out the window when you're in a severe life or death situation. Mars, where there's no atmosphere that you can breathe, where there's radiation coming down from space all the time. I mean, there's radiation coming down from space here too, but there's more of it. And you're living in this environment where you need to use science to get stuff out of the ground to survive. You you can't afford to be screwing around with silly ideas about irrationality and about you know, achieving power for a small elite and that kind of stuff. You need to be making this thing work and you need to engage with the realities, with facts about how human beings interact to make them most productive and, and they need to be free to be productive. And you can't ignore that fact if you want to build a sustainable successful martian colony you need to get the most innovation and productivity out of people that you can which means leaving them free and similarly you you can't be um, irrational about science and about fact if you need to survive if you need to use science to survive every day we're kind of lucky on earth in a sense that we can just walk down the street and be fine but on mars you need to use physics and understand science to stay alive so i think it will breed naturally a freer and more rational and more scientific culture where education will need to be a hell of a lot better because people will need to understand the world they live in to survive and to be safe in it. Presumably, though, the the opportunity to be a grassroots movement doesn't exist. It's a top. It has to be, by its nature, a top-down implementation of let's move to Mars. You can't just have a grassroots movement in Mars, because unless you can produce your own rockets and stuff. You know. well, I think it could be done through trade. Um, uh, Robert Zubrin talks about this in, in his case for Mars and in that Mars City States book you've got over there, how if you get the cost of space launch low enough, you get to a point where a group of people can get together and collectively crowdfund it and buy transportation. And you end up just doing it through a contractual system where you say, we're, we're going to found this colony, we're going to pay SpaceX to fly us there and set us up or whoever it happens to be. So, yeah, I don't think it needs to be one organization doing everything themselves. And this is one of the problems you get with a lot of the proposals in that book, is that people are still kind of locked in this centralized mindset of, oh, this needs to be a treaty between governments to run this project, and then this project needs to do everything itself. And trade is a really important concept in building any kind of society. Like, a Martian colony will need to trade with Earth, because even though basically all of the fundamental necessities of human life are present on Mars in terms of raw materials. You still There are certain things you're still going to need. You're going to want certain foodstuffs. You're going to want certain technologies that are coming out of Earth. You're going to want certain expertise. So you're still going to need trade. And the more trade you have, the more prosperous you're going to be. Even for the stuff you can produce, you might get better versions of it from, from somewhere else. So definitely approach this question through a mindset of you trade with others to get the best you can and I, I what i would like to see is a company like spacex setting up a so, sort of similar to what they're doing with with their um with their communication systems at the moment where they set up a reasonably free system of you can just pay us and we, you can use the thing and they, they just set up a transportation system that people can then pay them to use and then you and it's the same sort of with how it should work if you were colonizing a new continent on earth where private companies run ships to and from or planes to and from and you just buy transportation and then you go and find a bit of wilderness and set up i don't think you need to build the rocket yourself and do everything yourself elon's a, i don't know somewhat of a divisive character um and but i am me personally i when i think about him as a as a character i think probably would be no one better to be doing this kind of endeavor yeah. and partly because he doesn't mind just like he obviously like you just said he doesn't think about this concept of going to mars from the perspective of the state i wouldn't imagine he he's just a bloke going to mars and he's got money and he's going to do it and like you say that's the most exciting thing about an idea like that because once it's gone um, it doesn't really matter what a bureaucrat in his office says because he's not on mars you know yeah I and mean, elon is a creative and creatives are always complicated personalities, and he is a shining example of that. He is an extremely productive man, 
and a man with a very clear vision of the kind of world he wants to live in. And the reason I respect him and consider him a hero is that he sets a goal of achieving that kind of world he wants to live in and goes about doing it. Um, that doesn't mean I agree with everything he says on Twitter or um, some of his publicity stunts have been, in my opinion, misjudged. But you get what? that. Oh, I mean, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's the same with people like Richard Branson. Like all of these creative people who generate so much wealth and so much value in our lives are all complicated human beings because it's the kind of people who drop out of school or who have trouble socializing or you know it, it's those kind of complicated sometimes difficult personalities who tend to be the best at making the integrations that nobody else makes between two different things or having a vision that nobody else would think to have and we need more elons and more unusual complicated people because they tend to be better for for all of us and for themselves than just sort of you know your regular baseline person is and um the other thing with Elon is that I think he's gone through a bit of an epiphany in the last few years. If you keep an eye on what he's saying about things, he's gone. He's, I think he's realized what government is and what government can be like in recent years um, through all of his difficulties with SpaceX of trying to get his launch site set up through COVID lockdowns and then through Twitter and buying Twitter and realizing everything that was going on behind the scenes at Twitter. I think he's just been constantly, I don't want to use the word red-pilled, but like constantly shown the truth over and over again. And he's still in this tumultuous process of realizing and reeling from that. And he he fires out misjudged opinions occasionally, I think, like he did it with the Russia-Ukraine situation a, a couple times where I think he's still coming to grips with his new view of the world. And over the couple next couple of years, I hope he settles and and comes to see the governments are terrible but there's a way that they couldn't be if in an ideal society and that that there there are even the fact that there's authoritarianism in america doesn't mean that russian authoritarianism isn't a hell of a lot worse i think a lot of libertarians fall into this trap like um the the i don't even want to use the word libertarian to refer to them but like the national uh, libertarian party in the u.s who who are taking this mindset of because there's statism here and because the american government is rights violating we should side with Russia and China, which is just mind-boggling because those are orders of magnitude worse governments. Just they they are the pure distilled form of illiberalism, and and to have this mindset of just because we reject one, we must embrace the other. And yeah, I think Elon's just still going through the process of reeling from all of those realizations and hasn't yet sort of fully fleshed out his new view of the world, but. He's also, most of his energy is going into the productive things he's doing to trying to build his companies and trying to build this future. And I think that probably a lot of what's going on with him is that he's feeling constantly obstructed and resisted in his efforts to do that. And that's probably making him a bit salty about the whole thing. Well, I, I think it, it would happen to anyone in his situation. I mean, <clears throat> at that point, you either rebel or, or, or just allow yourself to be co-opted, which... Arguably, I mean, Elon's, like you say, worked arm in arm with um, the state. Mm. And a lot of the money they derive comes from, you know, environmental credits. What do you call them? Um, in the case of Tesla, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Those yeah. Kind of, I mean, it's not. he's no stranger to that kind of stuff. But I agree with you. Um, he is, some, some cogs are turning in his mind. And I think probably when you think about it, he's. it's occurred to him that, going to mars there's nothing they can do about it and what like or, or like once i'm on mars what are you going to do try and tell yeah. me what to do you know yeah i just hope that they don't do anything about it before he gets to that stage it, it, at the moment he, the, i mean look at the look at how many people like elon's the mars guy now isn't he like yeah. everyone knows that if if someone says right elon you can't go to mars that's going to be a terrible pr disaster for whoever says that i mean i i want i feel like it's a race at the moment between him and a few others like him who have this optimistic kind of Star Trek vision of the future where we create a flourishing culture, multiplanetary culture, and this anti-human environmentalist mindset of we need to restrict growth, we need to stop improving, and we need to slow down and go back to a, an earlier kind of lifestyle. And I almost feel like he needs to get his colony ship 
in the air or in, 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 you know, in, into, a, into an interplanetary trajectory before they take over. And I know that seems like it's probably not going to be that bad, but we are definitely sliding into a, um, a culture of increasingly restrictive, increasingly state-centric governance. Um, I'm going to be doing a reading group, actually, with Objective Standard Institute in a couple of weeks uh, with a book called The Ominous Parallels, written by Leonard Peikoff which is a, an, an assessment of 1930s Germany and of how the Nazi regime came to power, and then drawing all of the philosophic and cultural parallels with 1980s America. And uh, it's even more true now in the West of how the ideas that set up the Third Reich and that led Germany, a country full of intelligent people, philosophically educated reasonably free people to vote for and support that regime is leading us in a similar direction now where an increasing number of people are totally cool with restricting liberty and think it's philosophically right to limit individual freedom and to restrict people's happiness and wealth in the name of some kind of collective goal of improving society or or saving the planet. And the core of that, you say, is the environmental movement. I don't know if that's the core of the problem. The problem is collectivism, is the, the idea that the nation, the country, the race, whatever the group is, is more important than the individual. So, And that, that underlies every evil system throughout history. And if you look at, at Putin's philosophy, um, Alexander Dugin's philosophy, the philosophy behind Russia's behavior at the moment, it's this idea that the nation of Russia is what matters and the individual doesn't matter. Whether that's a Russian individual or a Ukrainian individual, like a person's life doesn't matter. What matters is the great nation. And if you're serving the nation, then it doesn't... The reason Putin can sleep at night, knowing how much suffering he's caused, is because he thinks he's done good for Russia. And he do, he doesn't need to be a good man. He needs Russia to be good. And Nazi Germany was the same. It was the Volk. It was the, the Aryan race expressed through the nation of, of Germany. And environmentalism is a similar idea of except it's kind of worse because it's not even just the culture or the group is more important than the individual it's the the world the 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 planet with no people on it is more important than people it's this very it's it's a rejection of humanity it's a rejection of freedom and of flourishing and you have to be careful again with terms like environmentalism because there are some people who are environmentalists because they're worried about the future of humanity and I have some respect for that. If you're worried that people are going to drown in flooded cities, that kind of thing, and your reason for caring about the environment is that you want people to continue to flourish, fine, in, to some extent. I think there's errors in evidence and reasoning if you're holding that position, but you have the right basic core value of human well-being. The problem is the large chunk of it that is actually explicitly about humans are a bad thing, humans shouldn't be free, humans shouldn't grow and improve. And it's an expression of the same ideology, fundamentally, of something is more important than, than human well-being. And, and a, a rational philosophy, a, a moral philosophy, is one that says that the individual human being's quality of life is the standard of value. It's A good society is one in which people are free to pursue their goals and live a flourishing life. And we want to create the richest, most flourishing, most freest, happiest society we can. Wouldn't one of the opposing arguments to that be that in this age of unbelievable technological advancement there are dangerous individuals i mean there's dangerous individuals in any age true but we're at a point where dangerous individuals could potentially (laughs) change the course of the world i mean i'm talking like i don't know how long it will be before the the sort of destructive power of the individual reaches that the point that you could have only dreamt about it a hundred years ago, you know. I mean, that's certainly so. That's the proper function of government is to stop people destroying and harming the people around them. Uh, I would. The, my concern at the moment is that the really dangerous individuals are in government. <laughs> and like Elon Musk is not a really dangerous individual. He, he's an individual who wants to save us from that kind of future. Um, he had. I think he's a little too worried about things like nuclear war, and his he has a, a, a somewhat pessimistic view of in some ways justifiably but he's worried that we're going to destroy the planet through too much industry and that kind of thing which i don't think is true Um, and i think he's probably also worried about nuclear war and things like that which are slightly more legitimate fears and what part of his motivation for wanting to go to mars is to escape that fate 
I, I would much rather go to Mars out of a sense of wanting to grow and improve human life than save it from some kind of dark fate. But he, he is a positive influence. And I, most businessmen are if they're not cronies, if they're not... And, and okay, the, Elon Musk has engaged in a bit of cronyism and so have people like Branson in terms of accepting certain forms of state aid. I think Elon might be getting to a point of regretting that now. He's somewhat seen the light on, on government. But that's different thing to the kind of business people who rely on government to pass laws that protect their industries and and it, they they become they become consumers through force they they use government coercion microsoft did this with the antitrust actually sorry microsoft was a victim of this with antitrust um, but other businesses google and facebook are doing it at the moment where they use government coercion to try and restrict competition and to um to secure their position and that's part of the problem of having the government involved in economics is that it gives business people access to power and business shouldn't be conducted through power in the in the force sense it should be conducted through providing the best service and providing the best product so when you start getting this interplay between business and government you start getting the the businesses being able to use force and in a proper free society with the rights respecting government businesses can't use force all they can do is provide good products and individuals in the same way Something that's just occurred to me about dwelling on Mars <clears throat> is that it uh, it strikes me as the, the it could be a relatively dystopian existence if because it would be necessarily important to monitor and track almost everything that's going on in that situation and it would be anyway it would be built into the to the to the hardware of of life on a place like Mars and. People find that very distasteful on Earth when when you have a QR code to get in and out of places or when you need to do this and that. But is that even avoidable on a place like Mars? I, I think that people conflate the the technology with things it can sometimes represent. So, yeah, when you see a security camera, you get this kind of Orwellian 1984 image of I'm being surveilled. I, I, I ask myself, is that a government security camera or is that a private security camera? If that's like a gas, you know, petrol station operator trying to protect his property, then I, I'm very happy to see that camera there. If I'm on a, a privately run bus and it's got a security camera on it, I'm like, great. If somebody attacks me, it's going to be on camera. Uh, like, awesome. If there's a... I, I, we were in Serbia a couple of weeks ago and there was this bizarre structure that had like seven different cameras and scanners on it. And I was like, what the hell is this? Like this thing is monitoring God knows what. Uh, and nobody's privately put this here. It's in the middle of the pavement, far away from anybody's business. It's I, I'm concerned what it's, Serbian government isn't a particularly serious threat. But like, you know, if this was a, a, a more powerful country, I would be worried about what I'm being monitored for here. Why is this here? And when you've got governments doing things like forcing companies to give you give them their information, people's information or controlling what companies can and can't say or what people can and can't say or monitoring your emails and we've don't even need to look at the US here the UK government's done enough of this of intercepting people's private communications phone tapping all that kind of stuff like if if government's doing that then yeah be worried um if private individuals are doing that or if 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 the motivation for it is legitimate if it's for people's safety or that that's a different matter and i'm i'm not concerned i don't mind using my contactless card or stuff like that i'm concerned if the government's going to try and hijack the the system and monitor the system so the concern about contactless payments about moving away from cash that kind of stuff is only legitimate concern because of the fact that government is so involved in finance and so controlling and regulating about finance if we had free money and banks were encouraging me in that direction but because it's more efficient and government didn't have any intervention in that then i would be completely absolutely fine with it it's we're only needing to resist technology sometimes because of the way government uses them it's basically centralization versus decentralization when you get to the core yes but that's not the fundamental i think it, it's force versus non-force and like i whether or not a business should be centralized or not like if you have a, a a global business should you have one big office and everything's running in and out of there or should you have all regional offices depends on what business you're running what your purposes are um i don't think 
centralization is inherently better than decentral sorry cent- decentralization is inherently better than centralization it generally is in practice i think but i don't think that's the fundamental and a lot of these questions it's very easy to misidentify the fundamental choice when it often overlaps with another choice and i think that's a case of that is centralization often overlaps with force and force is the really bad thing to be avoiding and decentralization often overlaps with liberty and liberty is the thing to be supporting what about with governance models though uh, presumably you would you would say that a decentralized governance model is better than a centralized one regardless of the force aspect of it generally yes i i think there's Part part of the issue is that we we can't help but package government into everything that government is at the moment, all of the things that government does at the moment. And a lot of the things that government does that it shouldn't be doing, it nevertheless does better if it does them on a local level. Like urban planning, we were talking about earlier, like government shouldn't be involved in urban planning, but it's much better at it if it does it in the city rather than trying to do it nationally and tell cities that are hundreds of miles away how they should plan their cities. So localizing government is better at keeping government accountable to the people it affects and keeping it properly specialized to the needs of different areas but um there are certain other things like the protection of rights like with the proper function of government like banning murder should be nationwide there shouldn't be but murder's okay here but not there and um, and may, you know, the 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 courts should be done locally to some extent but then there should be a national structure above that to keep it all accountable so um whether or not what what the proper size of government is in terms of amount of land or population that a government represents the important thing is there shouldn't be one global government or one international like i that's the one part of the sort of star trek vision that i don't get is why there's one giant earth government because if that government falls and turns into dictatorship you've got nowhere else to go you need to have that diversity of choice uh, the ability to go somewhere else leave and find freedom if one government fails Aristotle had the view that the ideal size of a government was one city and um, and that Greek city-states model of which you saw in the Italian Renaissance as well is quite good at providing that competition of economic models and um, social models but at the same time it can it can work in both directions you can it can give you more opportunities for freedom to happen it can also give you more opportunities for negative things to happen for too much control but when you have a competitive environment like that uh, and there needs to be free trade between them because none of these is really large enough to provide everything by itself. I think that would encourage a trend towards liberty and towards um, open, freer societies. Uh, one last thing I'll say quickly is that we live in this kind of fiction now that it's natural to have hard borders between all of our countries. And we should have borders around our countries because we need to prevent terrorists from coming in and that kind of thing, or people who we know are rapists or criminals, whatever, from entering our countries. That's totally legitimate to have a border and to police it. But this idea that you should need a passport to go everywhere, that you should need to go through customs controls to go everywhere, you shouldn't be able to bring 400 pounds of goods or more in and all that kind of nonsense, and you should only be able to stay for 90 days and you shouldn't be able to work. That's all a complete fiction of the last 100, 150 years. Passports didn't exist for most of human history. It's a complete creation of states that want to control their monopoly on economic activity. And 90% of what you go through when you enter a country is unnecessary. The only necessary part is check you're not on a criminal register, check you're not intending to commit harm when you enter the country. Beyond that, you should be free to come in, trade, what you shouldn't be is entitled to benefits but you should be free to come in trade set up businesses and you're going to benefit the country by doing that so we really need to get away from this restrictive closed off society and maybe smaller states is one way you can achieve that by the necessity of having more exchange because of smaller states needing more exchange by their nature do you know much about the medieval city states not a ton um I'm aware like the Republic of Venice was one and they weren't literally cities a lot of them they were they were small areas of land around a city or sometimes they were clusters interestingly in the Mars City States book they have the same concept some of those city states are really multiple small towns sort of networked together in a region and you still get that with the few micro states that have survived to the present day if you look at Luxembourg it, it's one city and a few towns t- together it's sort of a city state sort of not but I think when people hear of city-states, they think of Monaco and San Marino, of just these tiny little 
um, you know, a couple thousand people in a small area, and that's not really what a city state is. It's more like Athens. It's like you know, a, a, a large city and some land around it, but there's you know eight or ten of those in what would be a modern European country. Dr- daydream a scenario in the not too distant future where the centralizing force of governance has abated, let's say, and we're now we're, we're, there, there are these. Do we like what's your preferred choice for a sort of a world or or Mars? Say, say we colonize, you know, think of it in Mars. Say we colonize Mars. What what do you want to see on Mars? What kind of governance models? What kind of system? What kind of system for the whole of Mars? You know, it's much the same thing in both, really. I would like to see a large number of rights respecting republics where you have limited government and protection of individual liberties, uh, go- republics that are governed by a constitution that very clearly sets out individual liberties and where the government is not able to expand beyond the parameters of that constitution. Uh, so a proper constitution. Now, the United States constitution was like 90% of the way there to being a proper constitution. It didn't quite get there. There were a few things like the interstate commerce clause that left open the ability of government to grow and, and regulate. And and then the, the, the federal government in the US basically turned a corner in about 1930 and said, we're just not going to pay attention anymore anyway, and have basically been ignoring it ever since. But even before that, um, there was a lot of, there were certain things in the constitution that undercut its ability to protect liberties properly so a a really well-written constitution would be strong enough um to act as a governing document you can have a bad constitution as well but that's in my view the best form of government i I think um the united states was a fusion of roman republic republicism with um lockean attitudes to freedom and and that got most of the way to what i think ayn rand identified which is the the fact-based arguments for liberty and the proper system of government to protect them i would like to see as many countries as possible doing that and i yeah i do think more smaller countries would be better than fewer larger ones for the reasons we've discussed for flexibility of choice for encouraging trade for avoiding nationalism i I, I think nationalism is a virulent ugly thing I, i hate this mindset that i was born in this country that makes this the best country on earth like everyone has that mindset. I have Irish friends and Romanian friends and American friends. And they all think they live in the best country on earth. And Americans are often right about that because they live in the one country that was founded on principles. What about your English friends, though? I don't. Oh hear yeah, that. I don't hear that. Much. Oh no, I get that too. Yeah, uh, I mean, thinking of English Defence League and all that kind of stuff. Like it's very much a thing in England. You get Welsh and Scottish nationalism, which is... Welsh nationalism. Yeah, I don't see much English nationalism. Well, it's it's frowned upon now, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. it it's weird that Welsh, Scottish, Irish nationalism, even Cornish nationalism is seen as being kind of legitimate. Uh, I think it's because we're a, minor- a minority. Yeah, right? whereas England is the sort of powerful culture, yes. so to be... But I would like to see a federal Britain. Like, I, I would like to turn Britain into a more American-style federal system where you have Scotland, Wales, maybe Cornwall and Devon together, most of England probably, maybe London separate, um, Channel Islands, Isle of Man, Northern Ireland as states within a federation that all have... A, a balance of power between them all have law you know, set their own laws that aren't governed from Westminster centrally. I think that would make a much better, much more balanced Britain and a much less nationalistic Britain where the Scottish aren't having arguments with the English all the time about whose laws are being blocked and that kind of stuff. Um, a couple of questions quickly, um, going back to Mars. Do you, number one, do you happen to know what Elon's... Um, has he mentioned anything about a governance system already? And two, do you think the kind of battle between the state and the and liberty is an eternal one? Like I'm thinking about America here. You know, America began the, the American project began well and ended in a situation we find. Is that same thing going to happen on Mars? So, so you know, what what does Elon say about governance already, and will Mars suffer the same fate as the USA? Um, firstly, Elon, as, as far as I'm aware, hasn't talked in detail about governance. What he wants to do is create a free and open opportunity for people to colonize and trade on Mars. And I think he has a kind of slightly anarcho-libertarian mindset on this of just seeing it as companies operating freely. I don't think he realizes there's a need for some kind of legal structure to protect rights and prevent a, um, 
what well, you really do want to prevent a a I don't want to say wild west, but like this kind of armed conflict situation erupting between private businesses. That's not how capitalism functions. Um, I dislike the term anarcho-capitalism for this reason. Now, anarchy means different things to different people, but properly it means no government, no control of any kind. And capitalism requires the protection of rights. You can't engage in free trade if somebody has a gun and is going to use it to coerce you. So free trade and capitalism necessarily require the protection of rights and the prevention of force. So I don't think I think anarcho-capitalism is a contradiction in terms. Um, what if it if it's taken to mean completely free capitalism within a rights respecting legal framework then that's what i'm in favor of but i don't think elon's that clear on his fundamental principles i think he just wants to create a flourishing civilization on mars and recognizes that freedom is necessary for that um in terms of america look, like the american project hasn't ended yet fortunately i still think it's one of the greatest countries on earth i still think he has a, a hell of a lot to offer the world and it has a spirit of liberty in its people its people have a spirit of liberty some of them, that is exceptional and uh, is unlike anything we see in Europe, uh, with the possible exception of people in Eastern Europe who've lived through communism and have seen what socialism turns into and um, have pushed against that. But even then, you get some people in America who are so viciously and consistently defenders of liberty, and that culture warrants believing in and warrants supporting and i hope it can turn things around a bit and you have things like the free state project that are somewhat encouraging but at the same time there's a huge subset of american population that is embracing progressivism embracing that woke ideology that social democratic mindset of seeing the state as the answer to problems and then there's on the other side there's this purportedly pro liberty social conservative movement that is actually against religious freedom against freedom in things like abortions and education those sorts of areas and they're not really about freedom either they 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 they, they say the words because they understand that liberty is part of america's culture but they're really nationalists and um it, i think british people rightly sometimes criticize american nationalism because American patriotism because they see it as a kind of nationalism. They see it as Americans just thinking, oh yeah, we're big, we're cool, we make movies, we're the best. And that's bad. What's good is American patriotism based on America's fundamental principles, its founding principles of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It, America is the one country that there's a good way to be patriotic for. Because if you're patriotic for it, or, or you hold it to be the best country on earth because of its principles, then that's a legitimate thing. What's not legitimate is holding it to be the best because you happen to have been born there, which is what everybody in every country on earth does. And if you think Japan is the best country on earth because you like Japanese culture and values, that's legitimate too. But I, I've never understood the preponderance of 90% of people to think their country is the best just because it's where they happen to be born and the fields look the way they did when they grew up and the buildings look the way they did when they grew up. And you, you kind of have to correct for that in your mind and just think, let, let's think about this objectively. Let's look at every culture differently and assess. And cultures are not equal. I hate this idea that cultures are equal. The best cultures are the ones that allow people to live freest and be the most productive they can. And throughout the last couple hundred years, that's clearly the United States is the best culture. The United States as it is now in its warped and distorted form, whether that's the best country on earth at the moment versus somewhere like Sweden, which is a genuinely f basically free, despite having a high tax in certain respects, is a very free, very rational culture, or the Netherlands, or countries like that, or South Korea. There's a lot of countries that compete with the US for being the best country on earth at the moment, or the freest. But I still would say American culture is the the best culture. The, the culture established in America is the best one we've seen on earth to date. It's interesting you mentioned Sweden. I've, <clears throat> I've interviewed quite a few Sp Swedes on this podcast who would say, like they're mainly homeschool refugees that had to leave Sweden because homeschooling is it's disallowed in, in Sweden. So anyway, that's a whole other subject. You can go and listen to those if, yeah. if you want. <laughs> I, I spent, I've spoken to a lot of Swedes. I've spent a lot of time there. And yeah, it, it went through a reformation in the 90s and became a far freer country than it was before. And it has that Scandinavian rationality and positivity that makes Norway, Sweden and Denmark all very pleasant, very friendly, very rational, sensible cultures. But it's still got a lot of big government in certain areas. It's got a lot of problems too. Um last question or second to last question um do you think we will ever see sort of in the spirit of the usa will we ever see those kind of societies 
on Earth again, or will they not ev- they not appear again until we colonize somewhere like space? I think we're the sea. currently unlikely to see that on Earth again, unless it's after a a really long period of suffering. And I don't want that to happen. I don't want if you've read Isaac Asimov's Foundation, where you go through these thousand year periods of of dictatorship and dark ages, basically before a, a new culture arises. I, I don't want to go through that again because that's what happened after the original golden era of humanity, the Greek and Roman period of ascent limited experiments with freedom republicans republican and democratic systems of government and and Ro- roman government basically originated the concept of citizens rights and and then that all fell apart and fell into dictatorship and then we went into the this dark age period where there was no innovation there was no freedom there was no at least in in europe there was no progress no discussion for hundreds of years and i don't want to fall into that again and have to wait for another renaissance um, I would much rather, I think what's more likely to happen as regards a positive future is that hope probably in space, maybe in the ocean or something, a, a new civilization comes along that acts as an example that then helps the old world progress in the same way that America did. America made Europe freer. And, uh, and a new example, you, you can't have a country like America producing technologies left, right, and center, and producing all this culture and acting as a bastion of freedom and just keep your old way of doing things and ignore all of that. You, you just have to adapt over time. And that's kind of what Europe did. It just saw that example. And, and England also had a, a, a big contribution to the growth of liberty because the American principles were established in England, really, by by people like Thomas Paine and John Locke. And, um, and so England was also one of those exemplars, but, the, uh, but America took it a lot further. And what I would like to see is a culture do that, that then that that thinking spills back down. I, I would be wonderful if we could turn a country on earth around into a new home of liberalism. It, it's possible. It would require a, there's some possibilities. Georgia is an interesting one. The country of Georgia is full of liberal minded people. I've, I've been there and spoken to them and, and it's a relatively small country. Unfortunately, it's sandwiched between Iran, Turkey, Azerbaijan, Iran, uh, sorry, Russia, uh, it's it's in a really bad place to try and do that, but um, geographically and geopolitically, but maybe it's achievable to do that on an existing country. But these, it's so much easier to create big government than it is to destroy it, and it's so much easier to create laws than it is to remove them. It's such an uphill battle, and without a, a, a violent revolution somewhere, which I don't want to encourage, or without some kind of dramatic event happening, I, I think the much more likely way to bring about a new age of freedom is by setting up a new state somewhere else. What's your own personal strategy for living then? Bearing that kind of stuff in mind, you obviously want to live as free a life as you can. Sure. Um, I, I want... Well, it, it's difficult as well because we don't have the freedom to move wherever we like. So I, I can't just up and relocate to the Netherlands or the US or whatever if I want to live in a freer... I mean, I don't think the US is a freer country, but if I want to live you know, in Canada or Australia or whatever, I, I can't just do that. So I don't have the freedom to live freely in that sense. And even within Britain, I don't have the freedom to make all my own choices. I can't just start a business if I want to. I can in some fields. Britain's actually quite good for that compared to other countries, but you don't have to get a license to study hair design or that kind of thing in the way you do in some countries, including the US, certain states anyway. But, um, you know, my, my strategy at the moment is to advocate these ideas to try and bring around the kind of world where I and others can live like that. And, um, and to do the most I can with my life within the framework I have. I travel as much as I can. I I read and write and and I enjoy the academic and intellectual freedom I have. Uh, the fact I live in a country where there are very few banned books and that kind of thing where I can speak my mind, I can read, I can research history. Uh, I'm concerned by the tendency at the moment um, because of this kind of woke cultural narrative that's being encouraged by government but is coming out of universities mostly um, that there's a lot of rewriting of old books going on and um, this is another example of what you were talking about with new technologies, like the digitization of media is making it easier to manipulate media, but it's also making it easier to preserve media. It's easier to get old books, but it's also easier to screw around with them. So I enjoy 
getting old books and and trying to find stuff from before the current discussion started happening and get this kind of pure access to ideas and and to history and um yeah i'm just and my strategy is to learn to to live to the fullest i possibly can and to fight for the values that i know encourage flourishing and encourage better human life in the future it's a long-term strategy yeah i I, i'm not interested in short-term politics like whenever i go to free market events in britain you get all these conversations of what do you think of this chancellor versus that one and who should win the next election that kind of like that stuff matters to some extent because if jeremy corbyn had become prime minister we'd be in an absolute state by this point but freedom would be out the window basically but it doesn't matter to me whether keir starmer or um rishi sunak is prime minister they're both status they're both um they're, they're, they're both just power seeking politicians and, and and completely without principle we've not had a principal politician in government in in prime minister since margaret thatcher and she was basically the only one of the back half of the 20th century so um you know, I, I i'm not concerned about short-term politics i'm concerned about the ideas we're teaching the next generation are we teaching our next generation to be rational and critical thinking and curious that's so important um, it's what Angel and I are going to speak on uh, at LibtyCon is about the importance of maintaining curiosity of of being open. Uh, not, open-minded isn't the best term, but being active-minded, being interested in the world around you, and and encouraging children to develop that and retain that curiosity that we tend to beat out of them before they become adults. So, it's education is the most important thing. Is is bringing people up to be active-minded and curious and critical thinkers. Unfortunately, state education is completely antithetical to that and trains people to pass exams and go and slave away in some boring job. And, and we need, what we need to be doing is training people to follow their passions and be productive and be creative. Last question. Um, you, uh, you've got a one-year sabbatical. It's all paid for. What do you do? Oh, Jesus. I've never thought about that. <laughs> like, as in, I can just take a holiday or... You can do whatever you want. You're patronized, let's say. Somebody is covering all your costs for a, one year. At the end of that year, the the money stops, though. I would probably take a kind of writing retreat or creative retreat. I would probably want to go somewhere beautiful and warm, Caribbean island kind of environment, and just create. Uh, I, I love being in places like that because they motivate me. Like the, the, I try to get out of the house to be creative sometimes because being at home in familiar surroundings is too comfortable and it's too easy to slip into bad habits. I, I love being in, in environments that challenge and inspire me. And I, I would love to just have all of my time without needing to worry about income to just be creative and write books. I want to write a Freedom in the Fr- Final Frontier book and I just have very little time to work on it. So yeah, I, it'll, it'll be writing books, writing articles, maybe developing business ideas that kind of thing um yeah i I love creating i want to make things and produce things and and be able to look at stuff and say i made this so um yeah that's probably how i would use it good choice well um thomas thanks for chatting that was a fascinating conversation and um i've learned a lot i'll probably learn even more when i listen back to it actually because it was rather uh, it all happened very quickly um but yeah, thanks for talking and I, well, maybe I'll, we'll meet on Mars one day. Sure, yeah. And um, I say we run a podcast as well, my wife and I, Innovation Celebration. So if any of you guys want to come on that and talk about science and technology and, and freedom, we'd be very interested as well. Absolutely. Absolutely.